this evening, what I'd like to do, in, instead of, uh, well, actually, I'm going to make reference to our text, which is quite simply, you shall not murder, but I'd like to uh, read an application of that commandment in the parable of the Good Samaritan. And I'm sorry to say I forget exactly where I asked you to begin the reading. Is it verse um, 25? Good. Let's begin in Luke 10, verse 25. And this, of course, Jesus gives the parable in answer to the question, uh, who is my neighbor? Who are we supposed to love as we love ourselves? And uh, Jesus gives us uh, the example of one who was willing to love even his enemy, even our enemies, our, our neighbors, anyone who is in need, anyone that we can help. So let's begin in verse 25 of Luke chapter 10. And a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. He said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and went away leaving him half dead. And by chance a priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion and came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him, and whatever more you spend when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed mercy toward him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do the same. May the Lord bless his words who are hearing this evening. We'll return to this example of the Good Samaritan because I think it's a marvelous application of what the Lord calls us to do in the sixth commandment. Now, we're returning this evening to a series, I guess you might say. We like to put things in categories, and, and it is helpful. Uh, the series, Why We Believe What We Believe. And this evening, particularly, why we believe the Ten Commandments are still relevant for today, why they're, why they're still in force, and why we should still keep them. Well, why do we keep the commandments? Well, because uh, of what the Scripture tells us about them. First of all, that they are holy, that they are righteous, and that they are good. That's what Paul tells us in Romans chapter 7. It's really unthinkable that if these commandments are really like that, if they're really good, that we would not keep them. The commandments are really the Lord's unchanging standard of morality that have been the same from the Garden of Eden Uh, even to the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus lifts them up again to the place where God intended them to be after they had really been taken down by the teachers of Israel. We believe that they're still in force and they're still relevant because in the New Covenant, God says that He takes these commandments and He puts them in our minds and He writes them upon our hearts. You know, in the Old Covenant, God wrote them on tablets of stone. And the thing is, they were there and they were displayed for God's people to see, but they didn't actually have the power to keep those commandments. All they could see was the righteous requirement of God, but the fact that they were written on the stone didn't give them the power to keep them. In the new covenant, the Lord actually gives us the power to keep those commandments by writing them on our hearts by His Holy Spirit. Now, not literally, again, of course, on the, on the flesh uh, that is our, our heart, but rather He gives us a desire in our souls to keep these commandments. And we should keep them thirdly because they are the definition of 
love. And I think it's quite clear from even the man's answer as far as the greatest commandment that we should love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength and our neighbor as ourself, that love is still very much in vogue. God wants us to love. And the commandments tell us how we might do that. Uh, the first four, as we've already heard, tell us how God wants us to love Him. He wants us to put Him first and foremost in our lives, to love Him most of all. He wants us to worship Him, not only here as we meet together on the Lord's Day for worship, but how we worship Him with our lives. He wants us to live a particular way that honors Him. He wants us when we make promises, when we, we take vows or swear oaths, to mean what we say, to speak the truth and intend to do those things. That loves Him, that honors Him. And of course, He wants us to spend the Lord's Day with Him, the Christian Sabbath, to set aside the world and, and spend the entire day with Him. That's how we love Him. Well, we move from there, of course, to the, uh, the second part of, the, we might say, the, the second tablet although I do believe the tablets were both complete copies of the Ten Commandments, but sometimes the, sec the, uh, the next six commandments are referred to as the second tablet. Um, that tells us how we are to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, that we are to treat others the way we want to be treated. And I think as you read the commandments, you'll agree that that's the right thing to do. That's how we want people to treat us. Uh, we, we looked at the, the fifth commandment, which teaches us that we are to honor authority, all the authority that the Lord has ordained, whether it be in our families, whether it be in the state, or whether it be in the church, because we understand that God has actually ordained authority for our good. Sometimes we don't realize this, but what the Lord actually tells the authorities to do is to minister His Word. They are to do what God says they should do as leaders over these particular areas. And of course, it's not difficult if they're ministering the Lord's will to submit to them. The difficulty comes, of course, when they don't do that. And when they don't do that, well, they tell us to do something that God tells us not to do, we can't do it. Not, if they tell us not to do something He tells us to do, we still have to do it. We have to obey God rather than men. But they are to minister His will, and as they do, then we need to keep it. We need to submit to it because it is good for us. Now, this evening, we want to look at the Sixth Commandment, which is simply, you shall not murder. And what we want to do is look at the meaning of the words briefly, what it tells us to do and what it really doesn't tell us to do. We do want to see that it extends beyond the words themselves. There's a principle there that applies to every aspect of us. And then we really want to focus on the fact that as it does forbid one thing, it actually does require something that's its opposite. And that uh, I think all, all of these aspects of it, of course, are an application of love, but I think Particularly, we think of love in that last aspect of not taking away life, but protecting life. So first of all, the meaning of the words, you shall not murder. I think that's easy enough to understand. It tells us that we are not to take away life unjustly. Now, some people are surprised to learn that this commandment isn't really teaching us not to kill because there are instances in which it's the right thing to do, oddly enough, although not so oddly when you understand it. It's telling us not to murder. We may take life when the cause is just, but we may not take it when it is unjust. Well, having said that, when is it right to kill? Well, it's right when, for instance, the state executes a criminal for committing a capital crime. They have the power of the sword. That's supposed to make us afraid to do the things that would basically authorize them to take away our lives. It's supposed to suppress evil. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. It's just to take away life when fighting in a war, in a just war. Basically, it's an extension of the power of the sword. And it is just when we are defending ourselves or others from the threat 
of someone coming to take away our lives unjustly. Now, it is always wrong to murder, to take away life unjustly, but it's not always wrong to kill. Though we would have to admit, we should always seek to preserve and protect life when we can. So that's what the words mean. Secondly, we do need to understand the commandment doesn't refer just to the words. It also refers to other things. It has other applications. For instance, the Lord tells us that not only are we not to do the actions of of taking away life unjustly, but we shouldn't be thinking about it. We shouldn't be imagining, you know, uh, that action actually being carried out. You know, the thing is that applies to all the commandments, doesn't it? It's, It's wrong not only to do it, it's wrong to think about it or to fantasize about it or to imagine killing somebody that we hate. That brings us to the second part, the desire. It's wrong to have the desire to want to injure somebody, to want to take away their life. Jesus tells us that if we are angry with our brother, we've already murdered them in our hearts. We've already broken the sixth commandment. And then, of course, it also applies to our words. Jesus says we can say things that are very injurious, very damaging, that also violate this commandment, such as good for nothing, or you fool. Things like that with with malice in our hearts is the breaking of this commandment. And of course, anything else that in any way injures somebody unjustly, the things that tend toward the taking away of life. So this commandment doesn't tell us just not to murder. It also tells us that we must not do things that injure others in any way unjustly. But let's get to the final point because this is the one that I really want us to look at. I think we're all fairly clear on these other points. That it doesn't just forbid murder, but it requires the opposite. It requires that we protect life. The Lord wants us to do what we can to preserve life. Now, there's two different ways, of course, in which we can do this. The Lord wants us, I believe, first of all, to protect a person's physical life. I want you to notice that those exceptions that we looked at with regard to uh, killing somebody, which isn't really an exception to the commandment because the commandment is not telling us not to kill. It's telling us not to murder, but we'll treat it in that way. That all these exceptions really have to do with protecting life, not the taking away of life so much, but the taking away of that life to protect somebody else's life, to protect innocent life. You know, capital crimes are those crimes that either take away somebody's, somebody else's life or that uh, take away their freedom or something else that is precious to them, something that is, was injurious to them. And so when executing those who have committed those crimes, it is protecting innocent life. When you fight a just war, you know, it's not just, you're, you're just killing people randomly, but you're killing those people that are threatening innocent life. You are stopping them from doing that. And the Lord tells us that that is the protection of life. And of course, self-defense. Sometimes you have to stop with lethal force those who would desire to take away your life unjustly or the life of others. Now again, I think that's fairly clear, but there are other applications that we need to think about with regard to protecting others whose life is threatened in other ways, such as those who lack what they need to live. I think the Good Samaritan is a great example of this. As he was going down the road, he saw a man who was in need. I mean, the man had just been robbed. He had just been beaten. He was left half dead. He had nobody to help him. And left there, he would die on his own. The Samaritan saw him, and he saw his need, and he entered into this need. He felt compassion, which means basically he, he was touched with the man's suffering. He, moved, he was moved in his heart to reach out to that man to do something about it, uh, to the point where he actually did something about it. He came to the man, and he cared for his needs. He basically 
bandaged up his wounds. He poured oil and wine on his, uh, his wounds. He put him on his own beast and took him to an end and provided for him. In other words, he loved that man as he loved himself. If he had been in that man's situations, that's exactly what he would have wanted somebody to do for him. Now, I want you to notice that the Good Samaritan, even in doing this physical good deed to this man, who, by the way, was his enemy, is exactly what our Lord Jesus Christ did in his public ministry. I know that we, we, we look at uh, the miracles that he did as you know, supernatural signs and wonders that stop traffic and get people to pay attention, and certainly they were that. That's the way that the Lord authenticated his word. But let's not forget how he chose, you know, what kinds of miracles he chose to do he didn't just make mountains grow out of the ground or the waters recede, you know, the sea dry up, although there was an occasion where he commanded the wind and the waves and they, they ceased. But all the miracles that he did actually benefited other people, casting out demons, raising the dead, healing the sick, uh, feeding those who were hungry. Uh, he was ministering to the physical needs of those around him in his public ministry. And you don't, we don't want to you know, miss the point that every day that you, that you take a breath, every day that your heart beats, every day that you, that you have food to eat and you have clothing to wear and shelter over your head, the Lord Jesus Christ is actually doing the same thing for you that He did in His public ministry, only we might say in a more normal kind of way and not supernatural. He is the one who is providing for your needs every day. He is protecting your life, your physical life. You know, He also does that by providing things for people who are outside the church. If He didn't give good gifts uh, even to those who haven't received Him and who are basically His enemies, guess whom they would come to in order to get those things? They would come to you to take them away from you. So the fact that He is showing this mercy to them is not just a mercy to them, but it's a mercy to you as well. But Jesus is the one who is caring for you. He is protecting your life by providing for your needs as well as those outside the church. Of course, when it comes to the protecting of life, this also applies spiritually. What the Samaritan did in the physical realm with regard to the help and the comfort that he showed this man, Jesus also does spiritually for you. Because let's not forget, you were like the Jew. You were sick. You were basically mortally wounded by your sins. In a certain sense, you were dead spiritually. The enemy had assaulted you. He had taken everything that you had spiritually, and he left you literally for dead. As the Jew, basically, who fell among the robbers, only your situation was quite a bit worse than his, because, well, in a certain sense. Because death isn't the end, as you know. It's just the beginning of eternal suffering. But as you lay there helpless along the road, the Lord Jesus Christ, like the Samaritan, passed by. And He saw you. And even though you were His enemy, He felt compassion for you. And He stopped. And He cared for your needs. He washed uh, the blood that was on you, the blood of your guilt, by shedding His own blood to pay for your sins. He covered your wounds, you might say, with the dressings or the robes of His own righteousness, and He cared for you until you were well. And He provided all that you needed spiritually from that point even to today. Our Lord Jesus Christ is basically your example and my example of how we are to keep the Sixth Commandment. You know, we often think of it, okay, I'm not going to murder anybody. <laughs> okay, well, that's right, you shouldn't. But it's much more than that. The Lord wants you to protect life. He wants you to do it in the way that your example, your perfect example did it, the way the Lord Jesus Christ did it. He saved your life, and He wants you to do the same. Now, yes, He does tell you, of course, in the Sixth Commandment, don't take away life unjustly. Don't harbor ill will towards anyone. Don't injure other people with the things that you say about them, whether 
you know, not just something that would be slanderous, but even with the truth. Don't desire to hurt people in your heart. Don't injure them in any way, except, of course, for those exceptions, when they're coming to injure you unjustly or somebody else. He wants you to do these things, but He also wants you to protect life, even as He protected life. If you see somebody injured, what should you do? Well, sometimes, you know, the tendency is, I don't want to get involved. Pass by on the other side. Like, I mean, why did the priest and the Levite do that? They didn't want to take the time. It's an inconvenience to help other people. Well, the Lord wants us to be inconvenienced, if we can put it that way. If He brings a situation into our lives where we have the ability to help a person, we should try to help them in some way. If somebody is, is threatened, do we just run away and leave them to you know, the aggressor? No, the Lord wants us to help them or to get help for them. You know, maybe we can't take the person on, but we can do something to help them in some way by getting the help that they need. If they're hungry, we can feed them. If they're thirsty, we can give them a drink. If they're Naked, we can clothe them, or if they have inadequate clothing. If they lack shelter, perhaps we can house them. Now, one thing I think we need to remember, I think the Lord would have us, certainly He tells us in His Word that, that as we have opportunity, we are to do good to all men, especially to those who are the household of the faith. That, that is our primary responsibility to help our brothers and sisters in Christ first and foremost. But... As we have opportunity, Paul says, do good to all men. I think the Lord wants us to relate to others and to see them as brothers and sisters, not necessarily in the Lord, but in another sense, because even those outside the church are still a part of one family, and that family is the human race, right? We all come from one set of parents. We're all distant relatives in one way or another, and who is it that doesn't care for family? I think the Lord wants us to love others with that kind of love. You know how Paul uh, tells Timothy how he is rela to relate to uh, you know, the, the young men and the young women, the older men, the older women in the church, to see them as family. Well, in the same sense, I think we should, and I think if we did this, we'd probably be much more disposed to help people when we understand we really are related to them, regardless of what country they may have come from. We are related. They are cousins, at least, but to see them as brothers and sisters in Adam, and because they're in the image of God, still worthy of love and compassion because who knows whether the Lord might use that actually to bring them to faith in Christ. Now, uh, having said that, I, I do recognize there's a lot of people around who are going to be asking for your help all the time. We need to realize that there are exceptions even to this. The Bible does tell us that if a man doesn't work, he's also not to eat. And why is that? Well, it's because his hunger will motivate him to do what he can do for himself, actually to provide. Uh, we're commanded or we're not commanded to house or to clothe or to feed those who refuse to do what they can to help themselves. We are not to enable them to sin, and they are sinning, but we are to help those who can't help themselves or perhaps those who want to get out of the situation that they're in and begin to do what is right begin to provide, you know, for themselves. But let's not forget that we need to help people most of all with their greatest need, and that is salvation. That we are to imitate our Lord Jesus Christ in the spiritual care that, that He showed to us and to so many others. In other words, we're not only to bring bread to feed them uh, physically, but we are to bring them the bread of life. We're not only to bring them water to drink, but rather show them where they can get spiritual water for their souls, the kind of water which if they drink, they will never thirst again. 
We are to take the light and shine it in the darkness to help them find the way to life. They are dead, and we are to bring them the message of life. Jesus ministered to the body, and He ministered to the soul. And He tells us that we are to go and do the same. That is what the sixth commandment is really all about. Now, this not only honors, of course, the one who didn't pass us by when we do what it is that He would do, it not only shows Him love, but it also shows love to others. Loving our neighbors, we love ourselves as we would be loved, fulfilling the law of love, and ultimately, of course, making us more of the kind of person that the Lord can use. So let's remember, again, the commandments are really the law of love, and not murdering is certainly a loving thing to do. <laughs> Don't murder somebody, but it's much more than that. We need to make sure that in our minds and our hearts that we are not harboring malice against anyone, but rather are loving them. And we need to, to love those in the church as well as those outside the church, and not only physically to protect their physical life, but spiritually especially. And again, let's remember not to do one without the other. If you give somebody the things that they need to preserve their physical life, but you don't give them the things to preserve their soul, then you really haven't helped them to the degree that they need and the degree that you can. Let's remember our Lord Jesus Christ did the one, the physical miracles as it were, in order that He might do the other, which is far more important that He might minister to their souls. Well, let's, um, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to, um, to help us to understand what this calls us to do and to give us that desire to do it, realizing Jesus did it for us. Again, the table reminds us of that very thing. He laid down His life in order to save our lives. He calls us to do the same for others. Let's, let's pray.